Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here today. I'm Representative Donna Oberlander, Chairman of the House Majority Policy Committee. Today, we want to bring to your attention a situation that jeopardizes health care for everyone in the Commonwealth. Pennsylvania's access to quality health care is once again in jeopardy. Interestingly enough, not by partisan legislators, but by the state judiciary. The courts are looking to reverse progress that has been made to ensure access for all Pennsylvanians, regardless of zip codes, to quality health care. Their action has the potential to cripple the state's health care industry and break the valued bond between a patient and their doctor. If this rule is reversed, the insurance premiums of our doctors, hospitals, clinics, and other providers will skyrocket, just like they did in the early 2000s. Most likely, that will create conditions in which our physicians and specialists leave Pennsylvania, their patients, and their practices. I want to thank our members for joining us, and I know that we also have a senator here, and to the many people and organizations for their advocacy on this issue. We have doctors, nurses, medical school professors, along with the Pennsylvania Coalition for Civil Justice Reform. Their partners, the Pennsylvania Medical Society, the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, along with the numerous businesses and healthcare organizations have already galvanized their members to take a stand, and we say thank you. Today, we will hear from our majority leader, who himself worked in healthcare during the crisis, our speaker, who tirelessly worked on the successful legislation, along with two physicians and a healthcare executive who experienced it firsthand. I think that you will find their stories very compelling. From my perspective, Repealing the rule would be especially detrimental to rural areas, just like mine, where I represent Clarion County, part of Armstrong, and part of Forest. While we have good doctors in our Commonwealth and in our communities, attracting physicians and specialists to our rural area is already challenging. Traveling to Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Philadelphia to find specialists is routine for many patients and their families. In fact, I know a teenager in Northern Armstrong who has been bravely fighting a rare form of cancer, and she and her family have basically been commuting to Pittsburgh for more than a year. And she's received even more advanced treatment in Philadelphia, a six-hour drive from home. That's now. Stories like this are common in our rural Pennsylvania. If doctors cannot afford to practice in Pennsylvania, where will our people go? Where will our constituents go? So many patients and their families cannot make daily or weekly trips out of the area for specialists. I can't even imagine if expectant mothers or patients with critical needs or chronic illnesses would need to visit a family doctor that's hundreds of miles away. I also have significant concerns about the lack of physicians and how that could pose an even greater hardship on new mothers, especially in rural areas where we are already in shortages with OBGYNs. I also worry that many advances that we have made in medicine may come to a screeching halt if doctors' insurance becomes so expensive there won't be much money left to invest in state-of-the-art equipment or technology. Now I'm going to look around here and see if our majority leader has made it. Very good. Now I would like to turn it over to the majority leader, Brian Cutler, who himself worked in the healthcare field in those days and who has extensive knowledge of this issue. Majority leader. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. To everybody on the steps behind us, thank you for not only being here, but for what you do every day for our patients across the Commonwealth. As Representative Oberlander discussed, I have a history of having worked at a hospital. And I started out life as an x-ray technologist, for those of you who may not know. 
And I distinctly remember those days in the late 90s and early 2000s as a new technologist talking to the specialists in the OR, the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, OBGYN, and understanding that many of the physicians were put in a place with escalating insurance rates of deciding if they would continue to practice and provide care to their patients or if they would simply retire early or move to another state. And I believe that this, for me at least, is fundamentally an access problem. Because if we risk losing physicians out of the Commonwealth for liability reasons or any other issue related to their scope of practice, or they limit their practice, patients will suffer. And while we talk all the time about access, quality, and cost of health care, and all three are very important, the truth is if the physicians are not here, you never get to discuss the other two issues. And I also would like to highlight this important component, because the rule and what has developed since that time is really, I think, a great example of the three branches of government working together. It was a result of a statute that was passed and signed into law, as well as implemented through a court rule regarding the issue of venue. I do not believe that we should return to that time and undo all that good work of where we're wondering if our physicians will be there if this changes. So for me, it's as simple as access to health care, and I would certainly thank everybody here again for being here because it is so important. The truth is many of the physicians behind us would rather be at home caring for patients. But since we're now in a position where this could change, after 15 plus years of being in place, having been studied and worked on, we risk all of that being undone. So thank you very much for all of you to be here to cover that because this is an issue that we should acutely be focused on as patients because someday we will all be patients. And when that happens, I certainly hope that these great physicians are still here. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Representative Thank you very much. Thank you, Leader Cutler. Now we will hear from a local OBGYN who was literally days away from closing his practice in 2002. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name's uh, Bob Del Rosario. I'm an OBGYN in this region. And they asked me to kind of recount what, uh, what happened in the past. Um, 2002, several insurance companies that provided malpractice in this state raised their rates, it was unreachable for us. Several other companies stopped writing malpractice insurance. Uh, it, me it became an immediate decision for one of my partners who is a well-regarded, well-experienced, really at the top of his clinical game, physician to announce that he had to retire. He just couldn't afford to practice. Uh, pipelines we had out to try and recruit younger physicians when they saw what the climate was in this state, they, they really said, no, we, we don't want to come in. So we were getting cut off from above. We were losing experienced physicians. And from below, we couldn't recruit new physicians. Uh, it became an immediate access issue. Other, other OBGYNs uh, within our department, about three or four left the state. They, they couldn't uh, continue to practice in the climate uh, for several reasons. But the bottom line is they were gone. If we just look at that small, small number of physicians, you might just say, well, one senior physician, three other doctors, they all probably take care of about 15,000 women who, who need care throughout the course of their lifetime. And it was cut off immediately. Um, it fell to the rest of us. So we had to take care and, and that's an honorable duty. We gotta help out these people who no longer have a doctor. They got a strange face taking care of them. Uh, it's gonna create waits for appointments. You have 15,000 people looking for a new doctor. It's gonna create waits and that's a lag in care. That compromises care. Uh, for someone who's seen someone for 30 years, who's delivered their children, who knows their family, who 
knows who they're taking care of. Are they taking care of a kid? Are they taking care of an elderly parent with Alzheimer's? They've, they've gone through the life with that physician, and now that physician's gone. And they have to turn to someone who's got to recap that history and establish that right away. It hurts care. It hurts care for everybody. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be a member of the PA Med Society, and back then, uh, they pushed through with, with meaningful change, uh, change which uh, allowed the malpractice climate to stabilize. Uh, it didn't compromise people's ability if there was a, something bad happened to sue, and, and all the literature points towards that hasn't been affected. Uh, the changes didn't compromise patient care. I think technology and advances that are going on, everything's really improved and gotten really great in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, it enabled us as a practice, once things were stabilized, to hire new physicians. It was about providing more docs, more nurse practitioners, more midwives uh, who could take care of our patients without having a three-month wait, without having a two-month wait. But in, instead, being able to offer things like, hey, if you got an emergency, can you come in at 2 o'clock? We can see you today. You don't have to wait two weeks. You don't have to go to a stray center where someone doesn't know you. We can see you. We take care of you. Um, may seem very simplistic, but what that legislation did was stabilize the picture for us. We don't want to worry about doing anything else other than focusing on keeping up with the literature, keeping up with the advances in health care, doing what's right for our patient. It's all we want to do as doctors. Um, people earlier said we'd rather not be here. I'd rather not be here. I'd rather be, frankly, delivering someone's baby right now. It's a lot more rewarding. Um, but this will help a lot of people come to this state and deliver a lot more babies after I'm retired. And I hope common sense prevails, common sense which will benefit all our patients um, and every person. As this gentleman said, we're all going to be patients. It's not about doctors, us versus them, lawyers. We're all going to be patients. And if, if there's restriction of care because of legislation uh, that won't help anybody but um, maybe some self-serving attorneys, then that's the wrong thing to do. So I'd really plead with everybody to look to say, what is the right thing to do? It's all staring us in the face. And let's not have a return to these dark ages where we had to worry about things that had nothing to do with helping each other and taking care of each other. So thank you for allowing me this. Uh... Thank you, doctor. Based on his past experiences and those of many others, we know that the future is also at risk. Physicians and their patients aren't the only ones affected. Think of our aging population and the medical care of many of them and their need on a daily basis. This role reversal could also hurt long-term care facilities. And next we will hear from Michael Wiley with Genesis Healthcare. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of long-term care in Pennsylvania. My name is Michael Wiley and I'm a senior executive with Genesis Healthcare. Genesis is one of the largest nursing home companies in the entire country. We are affiliated with more than 400 skilled nursing facilities and senior living communities across 29 states with capacity to care for approximately 51,000 patients and residents nationwide on a daily basis. In Pennsylvania alone, we are affiliated with 39 skilled nursing and senior living centers. We employ almost 7,000 employees and have capacity to care for approximately 5,000 patients and residents each and every day. Pennsylvania is home. Our headquarters is located in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, in southeast, excuse me, Kennett Square in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I've lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania area for the last 33 years of my life. I started out working in this profession as an activity assistant 37 years ago, and I've been with Genesis for over 33 years. And while my company and I are proud to call Pennsylvania home, 
it's becoming more and more difficult to do business here because of many factors. Pennsylvania's punitive legal climate is one of those factors. Standing behind me on the rotunda steps are some of the members of the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association Board of Directors. These men and women represent hundreds of nursing homes, personal care homes, and assisted living facilities across the Commonwealth. Coincidentally, uh, we had a board meeting scheduled for today, but we found this issue and this event to be so important, so vital to the long-term care sector, our employees and our residents, that we dropped everything and came here to join you today. On behalf of those board members behind me and on behalf of the tens of thousands of employees who care for Pennsylvania's senior population every single day, I say this. This proposed rule change is wrong. It's wrong for providers. It's wrong for staff. It's wrong for our residents. And it's also wrong for Pennsylvania. I want to say this to Pennsylvanians across the state. Chances are you know someone who's been touched by long-term care whether it's a parent or a grandparent in a nursing facility, a friend working as a bedside aide, or a family member who can no longer care for their loved one at home. Long-term care is the safety net for our aging population and an employment avenue for direct care workers from all walks of life. But what happens if that safety net is pulled out from under us? Pennsylvania's long-term care facilities are already under attack from trial attorneys, especially those who are from out of state. To reignite venue shopping and to allow staff from Genesis and other long-term care facilities to be dragged into the Philadelphia court system, even when the case in question took place in Lancaster City, Montgomery County, or my hometown of Scranton, would spell disaster for the operators behind me. Philadelphia court, courts equal more favorable jury verdicts and higher awards for trial attorneys, not better care for Pennsylvanians. Most of the providers here today already operate with scarce state Medicaid dollars and very limited resources. Allowing this rule change will simply make things worse and drive up health care costs across Pennsylvania. Higher verdicts for trial attorneys will result in fewer resources to provide high quality care for our residents. Pennsylvania is the fourth oldest state in the entire country. We have to ensure that long-term care is stabilized and strengthened as our population grows older. This is definitively not the way to do that. This will do nothing but harm those entrusted with the care of our seniors. And my colleagues and I are here today to make that known. Starting tomorrow, we'll be launching a campaign to ensure that every one of our members submit their comments to the Civil Procedural Rules Committee from now through February 22nd. We'll be sending the committee a great deal of reading material. We'll be calling on the co committee to oppose this rule change, and we'll be calling on our state Supreme Court to oppose this rule change. There's no other way to say this. This proposed rule change is wrong. Venue shopping is wrong. It's wrong for our sector. It's wrong for our staff. But most importantly, it's wrong for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Our next speaker is a professor from Temple University School of Podiatry Medicine who remembers the crisis well and has serious concerns about this situation and um, how it may drive young new doctors out of our state. Dr. Pontius, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Pontius. I am a doctor of podiatric medicine practicing in Philadelphia, and I am a clinical professor at the Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine. 
Pennsylvania had a medical malpractice crisis in 2002. I know because I was there, and I experienced the tragic consequences firsthand. That crisis resulted in higher medical professional liability insurance premiums, and that result had consequences. Many physicians left the state, finding it impossible to practice here. Many physicians altered the type of practice that they offered to patients, eliminating high-risk procedures. Many physicians retired earlier than they had planned over the previous decades. Graduating physicians went elsewhere, out of state, to practice, and they saw no reason for anyone out of state to come here to practice. There were many losers in the crisis. First, there were the patients. Patients lost their doctors and had difficulty finding care. Healthcare costs rose, reflecting the increased professional liability costs, and those rising costs were reflected in healthcare insurance premiums that patients had to pay. Medical malpractice insurance companies also lost. Losses drove the premiums to skyrocket. Many of the competing companies stopped offering malpractice insurance. But the biggest losers were the doctors. Between what I was earning and what I was paying in malpractice insurance, I wasn't sure medicine was the right choice in order to be a successful and happy individual. I practiced more defensive medicine and as a result became less satisfied with medicine as a career. I heard of the Philadelphia jurors giving high verdicts paid to plaintiffs and how no one wanted to practice here anymore, and I watched as some of my fellow physicians moved. Three times in our past, Pennsylvania has been hit hard by medical malpractice insurance problems, the largest component which has been the availability of or the rising cost of medical malpractice insurance. In each of these crises, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh ranked the highest in malpractice filings, with Philadelphia over double the national average. Philadelphia plaintiffs are twice as likely to win jury trials than the national average, and over half of the awards were between one and five million dollars. Family practice medicine confirmed that the most important factor in rising medical liability premiums was the size of the awards rather than the frequency of the lawsuits. This is what I see in the field. Distraught families no longer blame God or fate for the death or disability of loved ones. They blame the doctors who treat them. The personal and professional satisfaction of even the most dedicated physicians is eroding. I listen to patients all the time. The mentality has changed to expecting a dollar for everything. It remains a common conversation I have heard over and over. The Joint State Government Commission in 2015 stated that there will be a projected shortage of physicians between 50 and 104,000 by 2030. Why would anyone want to practice here with the rising cost to practice, high medical malpractice insurance, and the anxiety that if sued, you don't stand a fair chance at justice? Everything I just stated affects health care if this venue change is accepted. Pennsylvania will lose a lot of physicians at a time when physician shortage is skyrocketing. Patients will have less access to quality medical care. Medical malpractice rates will increase significantly. Medical schools will no longer attract the most qualified people, for they will choose other careers over medicine and physicians will leave practices for positions with high salaries, better work hours, and less anxiety. I studied medicine to care for people. I am a physician and I am a teacher. What do I say to the students and residents that I am training who hear these issues and ask me if they chose the right career? The time they invested in schooling, the loans, the constant pressure of practicing defensive medicine may not be worth it. How do I answer them if this change occurs when I will likely leave medicine myself? Any suggestions? I ask you whether this proposed change in rules solves any crisis. I respectfully submit that it does not offer any solution to any crisis. Rather, it reestablishes a crisis which the original 2003 venue rules eliminated. This is an unnecessary proposal to address a non-existent problem that will create an unwarranted challenge to maintain the finest health care system in the Commonwealth. Please do not let this change go through. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Doctor. Our last speaker today helped lead the charge back in 2002 to save our health care then, and he's on the front lines of helping to save our health care today. Speaker Mike Terzai was one of the architects of a 2002 legislative package that restricted venue shopping and helped stabilize medical malpractice insurance rates. His efforts among those of so many others, as we have seen over the past 16 plus years, have kept our physicians here. Mr. Speaker. Chairwoman Donna Oberlander, Majority Leader Brian Cutler, to all the other members that are present here today. We want the physicians, the nurses, the hospital um, officials, and other healthcare workers, and especially the patients who rely on the access to their critical expertise, that we in the House Republican Caucus stand strongly with you. Thank you for being with us here today. It's interesting. You go back, uh, as our great speakers, just outstanding speakers have, have stated, we had a crisis. It was a, a, an enormous crisis at the beginning of, uh, of, of the new century uh, with respect to access to, to medical care beginning with uh, physicians, but, but really folks across the healthcare uh, provider spectrum. And uh, here's the thing, we made appropriate changes that had significant discussion and that got through the legislature, also found themselves in a rule a change at the Supreme Court level, and now we're going back to change it after we have actually stabilized, to use your term, doctor, after we have stabilized the medical malpractice environment. At the time, correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, there were OBGYN units closing all across the state. We're now at a point where, where I see some new OBGYN units coming into the state, finally, after, after these years. And here's the thing. I know this has been said by others, but our message to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and to the committee, why the change? What's going on here other than maybe something political? And we're here to tell you, please do not do so. And I'm gonna tell you why for a number of reasons. First of all, we've had a positive environment with respect to stabilizing medical malpractice and providing expanded and quality access for good care, great care in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. This will change that, will absolutely change that. It will put it into decline, not continuing to improve at a steady rate. During the three years leading up to that change in the venue, an average of 2,733 medical malpractice cases per year were filed in Pennsylvania including 1,204 per year in Philadelphia. This is no disrespect to the city of Philadelphia. It's a great city. But in terms of legal environment, it is consistently considered to be one of the most difficult places to defend a case in, in, an, unfair, in an unfair manner. In 2003, after the change, the statewide total fell from 2,700 plus to 1,700. And the number filed in Philadelphia fell from 1,200 to 577. Moreover, the number of medical malpractice lawsuits continued to drop throughout the state. And in 2017, there were only 1,449 medical malpractice lawsuits, which was appropriate. Here's what we face. We now face instead of the voluntary market for medical malpractice insurance that has returned and premiums dropping and stabilizing, providers practicing and opening for business increasing will have the exact opposite. The exact opposite. The committee is proposing the repeal of Rule 1006A1, 
which currently limits venue in medical malpractice suits to the county in which the cause of action arose. The rule and the statute that were passed were exceedingly fair. They were exceedingly appropriate. To change that and to allow venue forum shopping is patently unfair and is designed, designed to really take advantage or to leverage the legal system in a completely inappropriate manner. The whole notion behind venue is to make sure that where something occurred is where a suit can be brought and where the citizens of that community can hear what happened. It is not appropriate. I would also say this to our good friends at the Supreme Court, our professional colleagues. There is in fact, there is in fact a separation of powers. Please know that with this type of step, it is an invitation to a constitutional fight between, between the powers. It's an invitation to it. We will not not respond. Of course the legislature is going to respond because we stand behind those in the healthcare community that want to provide the best quality of care that they can. We're standing behind them. We're going to hear it in our districts from our citizens, from those that want to have access to these folks and do not want to see their offices closed or their ability to get care from these great people. We do not want that kind of conflict. This has already been long settled for two decades. Our leader, Brian Cutler, is one of the experts with respect to the issue of venue and venue forum shopping and why venue forum shopping is inappropriate. We ask those on the committee and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, please, let's revert back to fairness, let's revert back to common sense, and let's leave the rule as it is and the statute as it is because it was already a decided public policy issue. Thank you, Chairwoman Oberlander. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you can see, that's why we must save our health care. The prescription put forth by the General Assembly and the rule the court adopted in 2003 have been working. This has kept our doctors in our communities, and it has made Pennsylvania one of the best places for health care and medical advances in the nation. We cannot throw that away, and why should we? That's why I'm convening a hearing of the House Majority Policy Committee on February 12th in Lehigh Valley so that we can hear more about the negative impact the repeal of this rule would have on our health care community and on our patients. Our voice is limited, but we can make a difference, and we need your help to make that difference. You can help us. Visit www.pagoppolicy.com and you can let the judicial branch know how reversing this rule could hurt, hurt you and your health care. But please, before you do that, I want to just remind you that the deadline is February 22nd. So your comments need to be made before February 22nd. We cannot let the court destroy the health care in Pennsylvania, save our health care, because the prescription we wrote is working. If members of the media have any questions, we'll be happy to take them at this time. And thank you very much for your gracious time and attention. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, members, and thank you, everyone.